You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 211. This week a big thank you goes out to John for the generous PayPal donation. Thank you John. If you would like to donate to the podcast, uh, hit the link that I have in the show notes. Um, Or you can head on over to patreon.com slash history of the great war to find out how you become a recurring supporter and get special perks like ad free episodes or special Patreon only episodes. Last week, we left off with the Russian army preparing to launch their attack against Warsaw. Over the course of the preceding four weeks, the Red Army, led by General Tukhachevsky, had advanced over 600 kilometers. This large success had put the Red Army ever so close to their ultimate goal, but it would be as close as they would get. In the Battle of Warsaw that would follow, on August 12th, the Russian attack would quickly turn into a Russian rout. The battle that would begin at the gates of Warsaw would end hundreds of kilometers to the east, with the Russian invasion in tatters and both sides finally preparing to negotiate. Today we will be looking at the actions around Warsaw in the second half of August 1920, from the opening of the Russian attacks all the way through the Russian retreat. In the first episode of this series, I mentioned how important the Polish-Soviet War was to European history, and this would be the exact moment that I'm referring to. While the most immediate impact would be the destruction of the Soviet dreams of conquest of Poland, there would also be long-term impacts of the defeat. With the defeat of the Red Army, the communist goals for further expansion of the revolution into the West would no longer be possible. The goal had always been to make it to Germany, and then to use Germany as a catapult into the West. The Poles would prevent all of that from happening. Instead, the Soviets would be forced to make a complete shift in priorities and actions which would completely change the 1920s and 1930s in both Russia and Europe, all because of the actions of the Polish army in August 1920. The long retreat of the Polish army from the borderlands to the Vistula had completely destroyed the morale of the troops. One Polish soldier would write, quote, Six weeks of constant backward movement created a sort of compulsion to retreat. The soldier thought about it when he went to sleep, and it was the first thought on waking. It assumed the character of a disease, and its germs entered into every bloodstream. During those long weeks, we withdrew after every engagement, regardless of whether we won or lost. It was not cowardice or despondency or lack of determination, more of a habit that had warped every mind. This habit was the most dangerous of all. Where and when and under what conditions would it be possible to overcome it? A soldier of the 27th Infantry Division would report on the conditions of the retreat in the August weather that, quote, The road of retreat is infernal, the heat, the lack of water, the stench of rotting corpses, and the forest fires are turning it into a sort of hellish torture, continual shooting from the flank and rear. Part of the problem for the Polish soldiers was that the Russian attacks seemed to never end, and there always seemed to be more and more Russians ready to join in the next attack. 
Pilsudski would report that, quote, this incessant worm-like movement of large numbers of enemy troops, punctuated now and again by a sudden leap forward, a movement continuing for weeks on end, gave the impression of something irresistible rolling on like some heavy, monstrous cloud. Much uh, closer to the fighting, the fighting took on a very different quality, one of absolute brutality, as a sergeant in the 42nd Infantry Division would describe. The fighting had an insidious quality, since there was no trenches in which to take up positions. One had to expect an attack from any quarter, and in consequence, the fighting was bloodthirsty, as you either won or you perished. Our men were just as cruel as the Bolsheviks. Human life lost all value. We knew that death was waiting for us at every turn, because the Bolsheviks either killed outright or drew out the torture as long as they could. If anyone could have seen this wave of Bolsheviks advancing on us, they would have been astonished on account of their appearance. Some were barefoot, others wore leggings, others some kind of rubber confections. They wore a variety of headgear, even ladies' hats, winter caps, kerchiefs, or nothing at all, with their hair in the wind. They were like weird apparitions. With the army in such a state, and the Red Army bearing down on the capital, the political and logistical activities of the Polish government grew to even greater importance. On the political side, the country was starting to experience financial difficulties. The Western governments had extended several loans to the Polish government when it had first been created in November 1918, but by June 1920, all of that money had been spent. The only good news was that the arms and munitions that had been purchased with it were still arriving, and many more trains of goods were still on their way to Poland. Each of these trains, when they arrived, brought with them tens of thousands of rifles or millions of rounds of ammunition. And these new weapons were critical because as the Russians approached the capital, huge numbers of new volunteers joined the Polish army. After the start of the Russian attacks, thousands would join the army, uh, with more volunteers offering their service in the six weeks after the start of the attack than in the previous six months combined. 156,000 men and women in total would join the armed forces by the time that the Battle of Warsaw would begin. These new soldiers were important, and not just because the Polish army needed bodies, and they needed bodies, but also because they were highly motivated, and they also had not been present for the defeats suffered during the previous weeks of fighting. They were fresh to the fighting, and they didn't carry the mental baggage of a long retreat. With his armies reaching a new peak in strength, Pilsudski planned to execute a reasonably risky plan. As the Red Army approached the Bug River, he decided to abandon its defenses. In his estimation, the army could not hold the defensive lines along the river, and it would be better to trade space for time, retreating to the defenses in front of Warsaw. This would allow all of the army's strength to be saved for the decisive clash near the capital. There were obvious risks with this plan, you know, just letting the enemy approach the most important city in the country was a risk, but it would also give the Polish army the longest possible period to rest and recuperate before the battle began. While the Polish army was having a few problems, the Red Army was not without its own difficulties. They had put time and effort into the logistical problems of supporting the advance through hundreds of kilometers of Polish territory. This included organizing requisitions from the countryside and putting a monumental effort into rebuilding the bridges and railways that the, as the army moved forward. The rebuilding of the railways was particularly challenging because it also meant adjusting them to the Russian rail gauge, or I guess back to the Russian rail gauge after the Germans and Polish had swapped them over to the standard European gauge during and after the First World War. This task was hard and exhausting, but by doing it, many of the logistical problems of sustaining the advance into Poland were solved. Tukhachevsky and the Red Army had many choices on what they could do as they advanced on the capital. The Northern armies had now passed the, the Pripyat marshes, and for the first time they were able to coordinate with the troops to the south. However, the two army groups were under totally different commanders, splitting the Soviet front in two, and this made it hard to coordinate the two groups. And so Tukhachevsky requested that three of the armies from the southern groups be given over to him so that he could use them in the attack towards Warsaw. This would put him in charge of all of the armies that were at that point advancing into Poland. This seemed logical to the leaders in Moscow, including Lenin and Trotsky, and so the orders were written up and sent to the commander of the southern armies. All very normal. 
General Yegorov was to detach three of his armies and give them over to Tukhachevsky. The rest of his troops would then be turned away from Poland to refocus their efforts on defeating Wrangel in the Crimea, the, the last of the White Armies. This made sense to everyone but General Yegorov and Stalin, who was also closely involved. They did not want to be sidelined, chasing the defeated Whites while Tukhachevsky got all the credit and the glory for the Soviet successes in Poland. To protest the new orders that they were given, they simply ignored them. They would continue to ignore all orders from Moscow for the next two weeks, until after the Battle of Warsaw had started. Instead of turning aside and sending troops to work with Tukhachevsky, they would instead push forward in an attempt to capture Lvov and southern Poland. This, they hoped, would put them in position for a triumphant march into Prague, Vienna, and Budapest after Poland was defeated. These problems with coordination were strictly political problems and that would then manifest as difficulties for the Red Army that they would have to work around, and they wouldn't be able to. Regardless of the many problems that the Polish armies were facing, as they fell back to the West, their resolve and fighting abilities increased. This went against what the Soviets believed would happen, or really what many external observers expected to happen as well. There was a general belief among Tukhachevsky, Lenin, and the Western Allies that when the Polish army was put under stress, it would fall apart. This proved to not be the case, and instead of falling apart, Pilsudski began planning not just for the defense of Warsaw, some sort of, you know, desperate last stand, but instead for a counter-offensive. The idea of launching this counter-attack was driven partially by the fact that the Polish army had been defeated again and again in defensive situations during the previous months. Therefore, instead of relying on this to suddenly change, Pilsudski wanted to attack, which his army had proved good at in the previous months. His options in this regard were somewhat limited. On the Polish left, the constant threat of the Cav Corps made advancing difficult. It just opened up too many flanking opportunities. It was expected that the primary Russian attack would be in the center, right towards the city. And on the far right of the Polish line, the distances involved would just be too great. So that mostly just left either an attack on the center left or an attack on the center right. Pilsudski would choose the center right in the hope that a successful attack would allow him to surround some of the Soviet troops in the north. This had the added benefit of making it easier to concentrate the needed forces because he could pull from both the northern and southern groups quite easily. This concentration was just one part of the larger reorganization of the Polish armies. Up to this point, there had been two army groups, north and south, and these were split into three, and the units of these armies were then shuffled around based on need and capabilities. This resulted in a giant game of musical chairs behind the Polish front in the days before the attack, as the units were moving everywhere and trying to get into position before the attack began. This created confusion, but would be handled well enough that it did not completely compromise the ability of the army to resist the Russian attacks. While the Polish units were in motion all along the front, Tukhachevsky was making his plans without any firm idea of what he would be facing. He made the assumption that the Polish forces would be arranged so that most of their strength was protecting the capital, and this went against the information that he had available to them, which was found on the dead body of a Polish officer. This officer had actually the entirety of the Polish plan of attack, um, but the Red Army leaders did not believe that the information was accurate, it seemed too convenient, and so it was disregarded. With his continued belief that the Polish army would prioritize defending Warsaw, Tukhachevsky hoped to outflank those defenses by focusing most of his strength to the north of the city. This was because the defenses around Warsaw were actually pretty good. A head-on attack would not do well. And while the Polish army did not plan to entirely focus on the defense of the city, it would be the only area along the front that would come close to reaching like First World War levels of defensive concentration and strength. So around Warsaw you've got trenches, artillery, machine guns, barbed wire, all present in large amounts, and so it was important to sort of go around that. However, neither side planned to focus their efforts on actually attacking or defending the city. For very reasons. The Poles would focus most of their strength in the south, the Russians in the north. This left the Polish defenders to the north of the city in a very precarious position. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, 
but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. <laughs> These troops were of the Polish 5th Army, and they were commanded by General Władysław Sikorski. Sikorski had been active in the Polish independence movement since before the First World War, and after the war began, he continued that work. His specific method involved working with the Austro-Hungarian army to try and secure Polish independence. When Poland became independent, he would begin his time in the army. By April of 1920, he was in command of an entire Polish army, in this case the 5th Army, which was stationed just to the north of Warsaw. It would be in this area that the Polish forces would be at greatest risk, even if they did not know it exactly. They did not have strong defenses like those present around Warsaw, or the large troop concentrations that were south of the city. In total, Sikorsky would be outnumbered over 2 to 1 when the fighting began. He was also at a disadvantage due to the reorganization of forces that had been executed right before the battle. This limited his ability to prepare his positions and his troops for the Soviet attack that began on August 12th. On that day, the Soviet infantry would begin to push forward. The first assault did manage to capture some defenses, and succeeding attacks would also be a success. However, mirroring many of the difficulties that countless armies had experienced during the First World War, even in the areas where some initial success was found, it was difficult for the Red Army to push forward reinforcements. This resulted in several instances where the infantry attacks would push the defenders out of their position, but then they would fail to be reinforced. This squandered whatever advantage that they may have had, uh, because it just took too long for other forces to reach them to help them. These attacks and these same types of failures would continue for two more days. After those two days, things began to change. Early in the fighting, Sikorsky had given General Konecki a cavalry brigade for the purpose of finding a way through or around the Soviet forces and into their rear to sort of, you know, sow confusion. It was believed that this brigade could find a seam between the army in front of Sikorsky and the one to the north. They were successful in this task, and on the 14th, they would arrive behind the Russian front in the city of Chuchinov. The command of the 4th Russian Army, which was sort of the primary army attacking Sikorsky, had recently moved their headquarters to this exact same city. And with the appearance of the Polish cavalry, uh, the general in charge rapidly abandoned his headquarters. While the Russian general was able to escape, he was forced to leave behind his documents, most of his staff, and his army's radio transmitter. This daring cavalry raid had successfully removed the leader of one of the Russian armies, and it coincided perfectly with Sikorsky starting a counterattack. On the 14th, Sikorsky was able to push back some of the Soviet units in front of him. This amounted to a defeat of the primary Soviet attack, but Tukhachevsky and the other Red leaders did not know much, how much danger they were really in. Sikorsky's single army had withstood and was now reversing the attacks of three Russian armies, and Red Army reinforcements had to be moved north. Even with the additional manpower, it was clear that any chance of taking Warsaw from that direction had already been lost. 
On the 15th, Sikorsky continued to attack, although he was still a bit hesitant, because uh, at the time he was not completely certain what exactly was in front of him or what the situation was to his north. It was only on the 16th that he would really commit to his attack. On that day, he ordered an all-out attack by his forces. The attack was not a complete success, but it did gain some ground. Then the next day, roughly the same thing happened. Not a stunning success, but not a failure. Then on the next day, again, much the same. By this point, the Red Army had much larger problems on its hands, though. On the 16th, Pilsudski had launched his attacks in the south and was advancing very rapidly. The Soviets had two choices, double down on their defenses in the north by pushing forward more troops and trying to reconcentrate the three armies that were having problems in the area, or they could just give up and withdraw. This would be the path that they chose. There was one problem, though. The 4th Army was still heavily engaged with Sikorsky's forces, and they would probably not be able to follow. Only the 15th and 3rd Armies would be able to retreat to the east. Without a better option, the orders were sent out. The 4th Army was on its own. The sacrifice of the 4th Army was necessitated by the actions of Pilsudski's forces in the south. The plan was somewhat simple. The Polish forces to the south of Warsaw would attack and swing north. If everything went according to plan, they would advance into a wide front that would create an ever-shrinking west-east corridor for the Soviet forces in the north to be retreating through. If they did not retreat quickly enough, they would be cut off completely, which was the best possible outcome for the forces, obviously. For optimal chances of this outcome, Pilsudski had to wait until large numbers of Russian troops were committed to fighting in the north, and so for four days after the attack began, he waited and then on the 16th he made his move. This attack would involve five divisions as its primary attacking force, and they would advance across the Vieps River. Almost as soon as the attack began, it started to experience success. What they found in front of them was suspiciously empty countryside. The vast majority of the Russian troops were either in front of Warsaw or to the north of the city, where they were hoping to outflank the defenses. With so much empty space in front of them, throughout the 16th and 17th, the Polish forces mostly just kept advancing, encountering a few units here or there, but no concerted resistance. In several cases, the Polish infantry were moving as fast as their feet and vehicles could carry them. In Warsaw 1920, Lenin's failed conquest of Europe, uh, historian Adam Zamowski uh, traces the movements of the 1st Legionary Infantry Regiment during this time period. Quote, covered 54 kilometers on 16 August, and slept for only three hours before setting off on its second lap of 37 kilometers, followed by five hours sleep and a third lap of 45 kilometers, followed by seven hours of fighting and four of sleep, then a four-day slog of 125 kilometers, punctuated by snatches of rest, followed by a 14-hour battle of Valiostok. So this type of movement that Zamowski is describing here was not abnormal in any way. There are many Polish regiments with similar mileage in the early days of the attack. I mean, those numbers, the distances those troops are marching, that's as, probably as far as they can over those time periods. The Russian 16th Army was the first to be caught due to its position in front of Warsaw. Soon, they had strong Polish forces to their south, and confusion started to reign, and army and division cohesion began to fall apart. Up until the 18th, Pilsudski had assumed direct command of the 4th Army, which was executing the Polish attacks. However, on the 18th, he judged the situation to be sufficiently in hand, and gave command over to another Polish general, and went back to Warsaw to coordinate the entire front. At that point, he knew that the attack was successful but he probably did not know how successful it would be. Back at the front, one of the members of the French military mission, a general Char or a major, Charles de Gaulle, would write, quote, Our Poles have grown wings. The soldiers who were physically and morally exhausted only a week ago are now racing forward in leaps of 40 kilometers a day. Yes, it is victory. Complete, triumphant victory. The shock of the reversal on the Soviet side was only amplified by their belief before August 12th that they were so close to victory. Their confidence was so high that they were already looking beyond Warsaw and even beyond Poland. On August 10th, orders had went out for all German communists in Russia to head west and prepare to move into their home country. Propaganda in German was already at the printing presses when the Polish counterattack began. Then the disaster happened. But it was a disaster that, for days, Tukhachevsky and the Red Army leaders knew almost nothing about. 
The Poles began jamming the Russian radio network as soon as the attack began, a tactic that they had not widely used up to this point. This prevented Soviet communication at a critical moment, and meant that Tukhachevsky did not have a clear idea what was happening until the 19th. At that point, there was little to do but order a retreat. There was simply nothing that could be done in the short term to stop Pilsudski's advance. At the time, this order was sent out, and it was believed that the retreat was just a temporary measure, not a complete reversal of the campaign, which proved to be a bit optimistic. With the abandoned 4th Army in the north was Guy's cavalry troops. During the opening phases of the Soviet attack, they had started their own attack in the hopes of passing behind the Polish lines, just like they'd done so many times before. They were having some success when on the 20th, they found out that all of the Russian troops were retreating. Guy's first move was to take over command of some of the 4th Army infantry that he could find around him, and he began moving as quickly as possible to the east. However, Guy's presence in the area had been known to Sikorsky and the Poles, and there were some troops properly positioned to block their retreat. The Cav Corps had one more surprise in store for the Polish troops, though, and they moved much quicker than expected, getting around this Polish blocking force. However, all of this effort would prove to be in vain. On the 25th, before Guy's troops could move far enough east, the 14th Poznan Division of the Polish army, advancing from the south, had reached the borders of East Prussia. All of the Russian troops still to the west of the 14th were now trapped. In one last attack with the assistance of the 53rd Infantry Division, Guy attacked directly into the Polish lines to try and break through. For two days, the battle continued, but to no avail. Then on the 26th, the 53rd Division retreated into Germany, and Guy did the same shortly thereafter, partially out of concern that if he was captured by the Polish troops, he would be killed outright due to the violence and destruction that he had ordered all across the Polish countryside. With the move across the German border, all of the Soviet forces were disarmed and interned. The Cav Corps, which had led the Soviet attack for 50 days, had covered 800 kilometers and captured four major cities almost single-handedly, was no more. When the retreat did not quickly end, and then the Soviet forces were trapped to the west of Pilsudski's forces, the true scope of the defeat started to be known. The Soviet invasion of Poland, of all of Western Europe, was over. 66,000 prisoners had been taken by the Polish army. Over 40,000 had voluntarily interned themselves in Germany. And while this represented serious manpower setbacks for the Red Army, it also represented a failure in their revolutionary mission. They were supposed to be the vanguard of a social revolution that would sweep around the globe, and they'd just been defeated on the banks of the Vistula and it would be the furthest that the Soviets would advance. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next week for our sixth episode on the Polish-Soviet War. It will also be our last, as we cover the end of the fighting and the peace negotiations that would happen afterwards.